Welcome to Electro Online. In this video, we're going to summarize the three possible solutions for the source-free RCL circuit. So we know that we started with this differential equation, which basically derived from summing up the voltages all the way around the circuit. Here we have a basic RCL circuit with a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. And then we knew that we're looking for a solution where we can find the current as a function of time in this form, some constant times e to the st. Now the s is going to be negative quantity because we expect the current to be diminishing, especially since there is a resistor in the circuit that will take some energy out of the circuit. If we now take the first and second derivative of the general solution that we're looking for of the current as a function of time, we get these two functions right here. If we plug those then back in the differential equation, we end up with a differential equation that looks in this format. If we then factor out the a and the e to the st, which is the general form of the solution, we're left with this remainder right here, which includes the resistance, the inductance, and the capacitance. And we can see now that we have a characteristic equation, which is dependent upon the variable s, which is the exponent of that general solution. And then you can see that's in a quadratic equation. Therefore, it becomes the characteristic equation of that differential equation. We can find the solutions of that characteristic equation using the simple algebra technique, solving a quadratic equation. And then we end up with this general solution for S, which then we can write in a simple format if we let alpha equal R over 2L, which is called the damping factor, and omega sub naught equal 1 over the square root of LC, which is the natural frequency of that circuit if we did not have a resistor. Now, notice that the damping factor is larger when R is larger, which makes sense. The bigger the resistor, the greater the damping of the circuit. And it's inversely proportional to the size of the inductance because the bigger the inductance, the more it resists the change in the current. It tends to keep the current smaller. A smaller current tends to be less energy lost through the resistor. So now we realize that there's going to be three possible solutions of this general format of the equation because what's inside the radical, what we call the determinant, can either be larger than zero, equal to zero, or less than zero. So these are the three possible uh, solutions where if this is greater than this, then it's a positive quantity underneath the radical. If it's equal, then it's of course zero underneath the radical. And if this is smaller than this, then we get a negative quantity therefore an imaginary solution, although the imaginary solution does have some real meaning in this particular case. We then realize that if alpha squared is greater than omega squared, we have an overdamping case. If they're equal to each other, we have a critical damping case, and if this is smaller than that, we have what we call an underdamping case, and these are the conditions. And along with that, we have three possible solutions, and here are the three general formats of these possible solutions. The first solution where we have Overdamping is where we have two exponential functions with two constants in the front, and then it would be our job to find out what those constants are. Of course, alpha is simply defined by R over 2L. We know the resistance, we know the inductance, we'll know alpha, but then here we'd have to find the values for A1 and A2 to come up with the solution there. If the two are equal to each other, then you say, well, can we just go ahead and take the solution and then make that equal, but no, We'll see how that is actually defined and derived. Eventually, when we take the critical damping case, we're going to have this, the situation where the current is equal to the product of the general format of the solution e to the minus alpha t times a1t plus a2. Again, we'd have to find the values for a1 and a2. And finally, when we have the underdamping case, we still have the e to the minus alpha t. Notice we find that in every one of our solutions. But then we have to multiply it times the cosine and the sine functions, which indicates we'll have an oscillating solution when we have an underdamping case. Notice that the frequency of oscillations is no longer going to be omega sub naught, but it's going to be omega sub d. Omega sub d is called the damped natural frequency. It's going to be a smaller number than the natural frequency of 1 over the square root of LC because this assumes there's no resistance. And of course, with a resistance, the oscillation is going to be slower, and therefore we have a slightly different omega d than omega sub naught. Notice omega d sub d is defined as the square root of omega sub naught squared minus alpha squared. 
course, if alpha is zero, then they're equal to each other. That makes sense. If alpha is zero, then there's no resistance. But if alpha, alpha is not zero with a resistance, omega sub d, the damp natural frequency is going to be slower or smaller than the natural frequency without the resistance. Here we have the three graphs that are associated with the three kinds of damping. Over damping shows that here's the a e to the minus alpha t curve. Notice that we only reach that curve as he reaches the limit. Of course, this here is the t-axis. And we could put that on all three graphs right there. There's the t-axis. In the case of critical damping, notice it crosses the t-axis once at this particular location. That's where the time constant equals 1 over alpha. So that's the time constant. And then you can see that it then asymptotically reaches the curve again when you go out to infinity. And then finally, the third case where I have under damping, where I have the oscillation right here. Notice that the period is going to be larger because omega sub d is smaller than the natural frequency of oscillation without the resistor. So here we have the three general forms of the solution. Here we have the corresponding graphs. I'll show you what that looks like. Also keep in mind that B1 and B2 will be defined in terms of A1, A2. We'll show you how to do that later. And of course, B2 will have the J in there that's still part of the imaginary part of the solution when the, 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 uh, the quantity underneath the radical, the determinant is less than zero, we'll still end up with a J somewhere. And we'll show you again how to arrive at that as well. But at least now you can see that you start with the original differential equation describing the voltage around the circuit. We then find the general form of the solution, the first, second derivative. We plug that in here to get the characteristic equation. When we solve the characteristic equation, we have three possible solutions, all three dealing with either the overdamping case, the critical damping case, and the underdamping case. Notice what those look like. It's always a matter of finding the constants, in this case, A1, A2, A1, A2, and B1, and B2, to describe what is happening in the circuit as far as the current is concerned from a point where the current is turned on or turned off and then see what happens after that event. So we'll show you some examples of that as well. But here we have a good, excuse me, a good overview of all three types of solutions that we can end up with with the source-free RCL circuit.